Hello, I'm Tim Smith, the pastor of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church here in Fayetteville, Tennessee. And we want to welcome you in to this time of worship uh, and study of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, we are going to be looking at a parable of Jesus from Luke's, from uh, Matthew chapter 22. And it is the parable of the wedding banquet. Uh, I have to admit to you that uh, it has been a very long time, uh, I believe, since I preached on this. I, I don't really keep a good record of those things. Uh, I you have preached several times on the parable of the great banquet, but that parable is a little different uh, than this one. And so as we go along, it's easy sometimes to remember about the great banquet and then the wedding banquet and sort of get the two mixed together or at least part of the story mixed together. I think it's only normal that that would happen because they're both banquets. But this is the parable of the wedding banquet. I do remember when I was pastoring at the Boone's Hill Church preaching on this, but that's been at least uh, 20 years ago, maybe longer. Uh, but uh, some of you all may say, well, no, I heard you preach about it six months ago, so uh, who knows? But anyway, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 22. Uh, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and even killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the wedding banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are invited but few are chosen. And may God bless the reading of his holy word and incline its hearing to our hearts and our minds and its application uh, to our lives this day. I am sure that just about all of us have hosted or been involved with an event where we had to send out invitations to invite people to come. Uh, maybe it was a wedding, like in this story. Maybe it was a birthday party, family or class reunion. Maybe it was an anniversary get-together. Uh, maybe it was a baby shower. But we sent out those invitations. And we know when we send out invitations that not everyone is going to be able to come. Through the years, I've heard varying percentages that you can count on, and I don't know how accurate that is. I think a lot of circumstances come into play, but we do know this. There are probably some people that get the invitation that, you know, aren't going to feel well that day, aren't going to feel like coming. Some may have a scheduling conflict. Some may be out of town, and there are those that maybe just, to be honest about it, don't want to come anyway. But not everyone we invite usually is going to come. That would be a very rare instance if we invited, especially if we invited a lot of people, <clears throat> that everyone would come. Well, in this story, the king is hosting a wedding banquet for his son. And so just as in the case that we would do today, uh, invitations went out. 
They went out or passed out. Uh, it seems that he invited the nobles, the big shots, the important people, and invited them to come to the wedding. But when the hour came for the banquet to take place and the food had all been prepared and all the decorating had gone on and all the preparations had been made, no one, not one person had come. I think that's our worst nightmare if we're hosting an event that no one would come. And so um, the king then decides uh, that he is going to make it a more personal invitation. And he sends his servants door to door to personally deliver the invitation and invite uh, these particular people to come. Uh, in this case, they still do not come. We're told one went to the field to work. One had something to do with his business. Uh, we're even told that they mistreated uh, some of the slaves and even killed some of them because they did not want to come uh, to the wedding banquet. And when all of that takes place, the king becomes enraged. Uh, I think we can understand his rage and his anger. Uh, he spent a great deal of money. He's gone to a great deal of trouble to put this together. Uh, he wanted it to be a big day for his son and a big day for, uh, you know, the kingdom and the monarchy. And here no one is even coming. And he becomes so upset with this that he turns around and sends his servants out and says, well, go invite everybody you see, anybody you see. I don't care who they are. I don't care if they're rich, they're poor. I don't care if they're, you know, connected or not connected, if they've got any pull or not. I don't care who they are. Anybody and everybody is invited to come to this wedding. And so the servants do that. And as time passes, people begin to trickle in and we begin to get a big crowd here. Uh, it doesn't take uh, really a deep biblical scholar uh, to notice this is a foretelling, or as the uh, my literature teachers would have preferred me to say, a foreshadowing of what is going to happen with the church in the future. Uh, the Jews who have been throughout the Old Testament, the chosen people of God, uh, Jesus, the son of the king, uh, appears. Uh, he is not received. Very few of the Jews come to salvation and receive Christ. And in the end, um, the invitation is extended to everyone, both Jew and Gentile, which Gentile simply means a non-Jew, uh, to everyone. And we know very early on uh, in the work of the church, we see in the book of Acts, in the days of the apostles, uh, that the church begins to grow much more rapidly in Gentile circles uh, than it does in Jewish circles. It also doesn't take um, a great biblical scholar to be able to see the foretelling or foreshadowing of the coming destruction of Jerusalem. You may remember uh, famously on Palm Sunday as Jesus entered. Uh, Jerusalem, he said uh, that the city would be destroyed and woe to those uh, that would be there. We know in the year 70 uh, that the Jewish state and uh, the city of Jerusalem, including the temple, uh, was destroyed uh, by Titus and it was a very uh, bloody and uh, destructive uh, battle and war that lasted uh, several months. So I think we can see the what Jesus is trying to get across here, that there is going to be an opening that the people you would think would come to believe, uh, the Jews, those that already believe in God and are supposed to be looking and awaiting a Savior, uh, are going to reject him. And then it is going to be open uh, to any and all people. 
And that is at the heart of what we believe as Cumberland Presbyterians. You know, our theme hymn through the years has always been whosoever will. I don't know how many times uh, I sung that in the Kelso Church as a kid. Uh, it is uh, well known. Uh, we are the whosoever will church that whosoever believes can come to salvation. That you don't have to be part of an elect. Uh, you don't have to accomplish a certain amount of work. You don't have to be from a particular family. Anybody, no matter their race, no matter their education level, no matter where they're from, no matter what they've done or what they haven't done, they have the opportunity to respond and come to know the Lord uh, and receive salvation. Uh, Jesus says here, the kingdom of heaven will be much like this. And so he's talking about the kingdom of believers. Uh, and so it is open to anyone and everyone. And Jesus points out in this story that the good and the bad were invited. So everyone's invited. Uh, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past, or what you've not done, or what you've tried to do and weren't able to do. Uh, it doesn't matter what's going to happen tomorrow in your life. All people have the opportunity to attend this banquet. Everyone, great and small, is invited uh, to receive the salvation and the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, we know today that that message is still relevant. The message is still the same. Uh, sadly, we know that there are people today that accept this invitation and become Christians and believers in Christ, and there are those that don't. There are those that are so caught up in their own lives that they don't do it. Uh, I think there are many people that really are not focused on their spiritual life, uh, not thinking about their souls and the importance to care for our souls. They're just thinking about the physical world. I think there are also others that uh, would be quick to tell you they don't have time to come to church. Um, they don't have time uh, to be involved in the cause of Christ. I looked back and couldn't help but notice the reasons that several of the nobles uh, turned down why they could not come to the banquet. One said he had to go to this field, he had to go work. Another had to tend to his business. And I think sometimes uh, we can get so caught up in our own affairs that we leave God out. And that is a very dangerous thing. And I believe it may be more dangerous today than it has ever been because we are living in an age of busyness. You know, we're busier than we've ever been, which I find interesting because we have all these time-saving devices. We have computers, we have dishwashers, we have washing machines, we have robot vacuum cleaners, we have cars, we have all these things uh, that are designed to save us time, yet we are busier than ever. And so we need to be sure that the busyness uh, does not keep us from answering the invitation to be a follower of Jesus. We're told that in the end, a large crowd files in to this big wedding banquet and all seems to be going well. And we know that throughout the history of the world, uh, hundreds of millions, billions of people have become Christians and have come to know Jesus Christ and become a new creation in him and found hope and meaning and new life through Jesus. That is pretty much where the parable takes us to, isn't it? Up until now, it's been pretty easy to follow, pretty easy to understand, it's pretty clear cut. But as is often the case in Jesus' parables, there's always a little twist at the end. There's always a surprise. And it's that surprise that often is the teaching moment where Jesus is really trying to teach us something. And we see that here. Because, uh, and you know, that, that's, that's always um, sort of catches us off guard. I know uh, sometimes I'll be watching a mystery movie. Some of you may be reading a book. 
and you think you've got it figured out who did it. And then at the end, there's that twist that throws you off and you're caught off guard by it. That's sort of the way this parable is presented. You know, here the king has invited anybody and everybody to come. You know, he doesn't care how poor you are. He doesn't care, you know, who who you are, what family you're from. He has invited everyone to come. Yet when the king comes out and sees this large crowd of people, uh, no doubt he's pleased there's a large crowd there, but he notices one man in particular. It's the only guest at this banquet that, is described to us in this story, and we are told he is not dressed properly. Now, exactly what that means, we don't know. Um, Were his clothes dirty? Uh, Was he dressed too casual? Uh, Most of the time, if we're going to go to a wedding, even today, uh, we're going to dress up. I have noticed that in my lifetime, people don't spiff up near as much to go to a wedding or a funeral or church or anywhere uh, as much as they used to do. But apparently, this man did not make any preparations uh, to attend this banquet. And we are surprised, I think, when the king becomes very upset with this man because he says, how did you even get in here? You're not even dressed for the occasion. And the first answer we want to give back to that is, is, well, hey, king, you you invited everybody. I mean, you invited anybody and everybody to come, so uh, you didn't say anything about a dress code being necessary. But we see here that apparently it is necessary. Uh, The king evidently is insulted that this man did not take the necessary preparations and was not showing respect maybe uh, to his son or to the king by coming ill-prepared to the banquet. And we're told that the man is bound and he is cast out. He is thrown out of the banquet. And Jesus says, this is as it will be in the kingdom of heaven. So here we've been hearing everybody's invited, anybody and everybody. But now one of those that came is thrown out because he's not dressed properly. He's not prepared. And I think this is an important, very important lesson for us. And that is one has to accept the invitation of Jesus Christ and one has to accept it sincerely. There has to truly be a change of the heart the change of the attitude, the change of the soul. You know, there is the belief today held by some uh, that there is or will be uh, universal salvation. Uh, Basically, that means, in simplifying that for the average person, it simply means they believe that everyone will be saved. I mentioned last week that my favorite theologian is William Barclay, and uh, I I really like his writings and have learned a great deal from him, but I disagree with his view on universal salvation. He believes that in the end, uh, everyone will be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. I think this parable clearly points out that's not the case. Uh, It's not the only place in the Bible where we are talked about people being cast away or thrown out or removed, but Jesus is making clear to us that we have to take serious our commitment to follow Christ. And so this man that is not dressed properly, uh, he represents to me, and I'm sure there are different opinions out there, but when I thought about him this week, he represented to me the person that goes through the motions of being a Christian, you know, Maybe they were raised in the church. Maybe they've been baptized. Their name's on a church roll somewhere. They're not very committed to the church. Uh, They don't have much of a spiritual discipline. Uh, They don't pray much. Uh, They don't attend church or participate in church very often. 
You know, they're the people that come two, three times a year type person. Uh, but if you were to ask them, are you a Christian? They would quickly say, yes, I'm a Christian. Uh, if you said, are you going to heaven? They would say, yes, I'm going to heaven. But we see here that unless one has truly been changed, unless one has been made clean by the blood of Christ, uh, they are not going to be able to enter into heaven. I'm reminded that when John looked into heaven in his vision, he talks about seeing everyone in white robes and that they had been made clean by the blood of the Lamb, which, of course, sounds crazy. Um, if you get blood on anything, it's going to you know, mark it red. It's probably going to be a stain you can't get out. But John is making the point that the blood of Christ cleanses us of all our unrighteousness. And we need to fully accept uh, that invitation. Uh, God does not force people uh, to come to salvation. God is not going to force you to believe in Him. If you don't want to believe in Him, uh, I think that breaks God's heart, but He is not going to uh, stop you from doing that or force you to believe in Him. Uh, if you don't want to accept Christ, uh, that's your decision to make, and everybody uh, has to make that decision. Uh, we're all invited, and just like when we get an invitation to go to a party or some function, we decide for ourselves whether we are going to go or whether we are not going to go. Uh, it's not going to be forced upon us, and God is not going to force people uh, to submit to Him and to believe. Uh, we all have a choice and a decision to make, and we have to decide for ourselves whether or not we will accept Christ's invitation to be a Christian and to receive salvation and have the opportunity of everlasting life in heaven. That's a choice we all have to make. Uh, you can't make that choice for me. I can't make that choice for you. If I could make the choice for other people, I would make it for everybody. But we don't get to make that choice. We have to stand for ourselves before the Lord. I've got a good friend of mine that um, anytime we start talking about church, he always talks about his mother. He talks about his mother's faith and how dedicated she was to the church and how involved she was to the church and his grandmother and how involved she was. And I have no doubt that both those ladies were very faithful, very dedicated servants of the Lord. I don't have any reason to doubt that they are in heaven now and in the presence of God. But they cannot get him in. He has to stand on his own. Our parents and grandparents, as much as they might want to make that decision for us, they cannot. We have to make that decision. And really, we are faced with two decisions. The first decision we are faced with is, are we going to accept Christ's invitation to be a Christian? Are we going to accept his invitation to believe in him, to be forgiven our sins, to be reconciled with our creator, to be made a new creation, and to have the opportunity of life forevermore in heaven. Uh, you may have never made that decision. You may have thought about it. Uh, you may have considered it, uh, but for whatever reason, you've not made that decision official. You put it off. You Often we put those things off, like a lot of things, we put those things off until tomorrow. And then tomorrow gets here and we put it off a little bit longer. But I would plead with you today that if you have never given your life to Christ, uh, now is the time to do that. Uh, you need to accept that invitation while it is available to us and respond uh, to the invitation of love and grace uh, that God has offered to us. I also think there is another category here we have to think about. You know, here we have this man that accepted the invitation to come. 
but he wasn't dressed properly. He wasn't prepared. And I think sometimes we go through the motions of being a Christian, but we have not sincerely been changed. You know, when we become a Christian, our heart is to change. Uh, we are to have a different attitude. Our life is to all be about serving the Lord and caring for other people and loving others. And it is one thing to go through the motions of being baptized or having our name on a church roll somewhere, but those by themselves will not save us. We have to truly be a changed person. We have to truly make Jesus the Lord of our life, lest we run the risk of being as this man who came to the banquet but was cast out because he had not taken seriously uh, being there. And we know today there are many Christians, uh, people that claim to be Christians, people that may be Christians, that don't really take serious uh, their commitment uh, to serve the Lord in their daily life. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us and thankful that you do invite us. Thankful that your invitation is open to any and all of us, no matter how many mistakes we have made in our life, no matter how many times we have failed in serving you, you continue to invite us to your table. We ask, Lord, that if there are those that have never come to know you, that today they might open their hearts and minds to your ways. And we pray that we might all take our commitments to you seriously so that we might live and be an example and witness to others. We ask that you would forgive us of our sins and the times we have lacked commitment, the times we have failed to uh, follow the law of love and to truly serve you as our Lord and Master. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Once again, I'm Tim Smith, pastor of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Fayetteville, Tennessee. We'd love to have you come worship with us in person. We're located at 1015 Lewisburg Highway. And we have our 8.30 a.m. casual service downstairs. It's a little bit more laid back, and it's followed by a breakfast. Uh, and then at 10.30, we have our uh, traditional worship service in the sanctuary. May God bless you, and hope you have a wonderful week ahead.